Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The blessed, blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, 
I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hevites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. The word of the Lord. A reading from the Epistle to the Romans, Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. 
Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, and take up their cross, and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming. Gospel of the Lord. From disorder to reorder. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. morning. (laughs) Great to be back with you. Um, A little over a week ago, I was in the mountains of western North Carolina at Valley Crucis, as they say it, which is the Vale of the Cross which I found out was an Episcopal mission that was founded in 1837. I was there for a week-long wisdom school with the Reverend Cynthia Bourgeau on her new book, Eye of the Heart, A Spiritual Journey into the Imaginal Realm, which comes out this fall. There were 40 of us on the ground, safely and in person together, with hopes to collectively raise our vibrational frequency and our consciousness for the energetic transformation of our planet. Small task. It was a monastic week full of a lot of meditation, teachings, mindful communal work, silence to let all of these things sink into our bodies, and unspeakable joy. To be with people in flesh and blood in nature was life-giving, especially during a global pandemic. And just this past Friday, I kicked off the very beginnings of the 2020-2021 year for our Wisdom School with our noon meditation circle at the beach. I decided we all needed to get outside, so I packed up the tripod, grabbed an umbrella, and some books and set up shop by the ocean at Red Reef Park. And several of us held the sacred space and God together via Facebook Live while listening to the sounds of the sea, the birds of the air, and the laughter of a nearby Italian family. 
I read from a book that has a lot to say about today's gospel and a book our wisdom school will be going through over the next several weeks to set the stage for the transformation that Jesus brought. It's called The Wisdom Jesus, Transforming Heart and Mind, A New Perspective on Christ and His Message. And I look forward to teaching in a number of contexts this fall, this very book. And the quote that I literally opened up to on Friday directly correlates to Jesus' sentiments in today's Gospel according to Matthew about how denying ourselves raises us to life. About how denying ourselves raises us to life. But before we go straight into today's gospel, I'd like to say, I'd like to lay out a bit of a roadmap that's revealed itself in today's incredible lectionary readings. We began the Liturgy of the Word this morning with one of the most famous passages in Hebrew scripture, the calling of Moses from the burning bush and God revealing God's name to the Israelites. The setting is Mount Horeb, the famous mountain that means glowing, heat, sun, that Moses will eventually climb again to retrieve the Ten Commandments. The scene is pretty wild. An angel appears to Moses in a flame of fire out of a bush, and the bush was ablaze, yet not consumed. And Moses is absolutely struck and bewildered by this vision. But then out of the burning bush that is not consumed, the voice of God yells, Moses, Moses, come no closer. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And we're told that at this proclamation, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. God then confesses to have been observing the misery of his people at the hands of the Egyptians and has heard their cry for liberation and freedom for new life. And says he is sending Moses to Pharaoh to lead their rescue operation. And like most leaders, God calls in Hebrew scripture, Moses is dumbfounded, wondering who is he that God should call him for such an enormous mission. And God responds to him with these miraculous words. I will be with you. I will be with you. And Moses replies, but what am I to tell the Israelites after saying, I saw and heard the voice of God? They will surely ask me for your name. What will I tell them? The roots of anthropomorphism or personification run deep in our DNA, do they not? Our tendency to think of God as a person. But God, being God, eclipses all containers that humans could put God in by quipping to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. Thus, you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. I am the name of God. Or as most of Judaism favors the translation, I will be what I will be. It's a miraculous statement that I don't think we spend too much time contemplating. God's identity being the great I am. I will be what I will be. 
And it's this story at the headwaters of our scriptures that lays the groundwork for Jesus to say, for those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life will find it. In other words, just as God played Houdini with the name labeling game by basically saying, there is no place or space that I do not occupy. Jesus is also elusive, saying nothing is as it seems if you want to truly follow me. Then we have Paul's letter to the Romans, which gives us a taste of the fruits of the Spirit and the Beatitudes. Paul writes, let love be genuine. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another. Rejoice in hope. Rejoice in hope. A timely message when hope seems to be in short supply. Be patient in suffering. Paul acknowledges that suffering is real, and he calls us to be patient in it. Persevere in prayer. Be hospitable to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony. Do not repay evil with evil. Live peaceably with all as much as possible. Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. This is a tall, incredibly tall order. St. Paul felt from the force of Jesus' life and ministry that he shared with the world. Which leaves us, leaves us asking the question that the sequence him did. What does the Lord require? And as we sang the answer four times, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly humbly with your God. The great I am, who is always with us. What Moses saw in the burning bush, St. Paul saw and sensed a flame in his heart. I will be what I will be. Go and liberate. Set the slaves free. And in this morning's gospel, after hitting a home run last week, Peter has an epic fail today. (laughs) If you recall last Sunday's gospel and Father Andrew's sermon, Jesus asked Peter point blank, who do you say that I am? And Peter exclaims, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus, thrilled with his answer, thrilled with the idea that perhaps some of his closest followers are in fact getting it, responds, Blessed are you, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus then goes on to boldly claim that Peter is to be the rock upon which he will build his church. But just two small verses later, we have today's difficult words. Jesus is beginning to foretell the gruesomeness that lies ahead. He begins to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands, notably, at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes. That's religious leaders of empire. He says he indeed will die and be resurrected. Peter interrupts Jesus, rebukes him, and shouts, 
God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But Jesus, ever aware of the evil energy that has seeped into this discourse, turns to Peter and shouts back, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And there we have it. Within the span of two small verses, Peter goes from rock to stumbling block. Is this not too often the rhythm of the human condition? Peter, the rock on which the church will be built, Peter, the disciple who's been given the keys to the kingdom, is now called Satan because he's once again slipped out of divine consciousness, that is, the mind of God, and back into the ways of the world. As one's level of being decreases, the old meanings return. So what is he missing? And more importantly, what does Jesus mean when he says, if you want to become my followers, deny yourself and take, take up your cross and follow me? For those who want to save their life, that is, hoard up all the impermanent things, you will lose your life. And for those who lose their life, that is what St. Paul calls kenosis, a self-emptying surrender, you will find it. Just as Moses balked at his initial call to lead the Israelites to freedom, Peter balks at Jesus. So it appears that call stories are never really understood the first time around. But like spiritual practices, take time to crystallize in our beings for us to see the picture more clearly. <clears throat> but to Peter's credit, like God in the burning bush, Jesus is a demanding and ultimately effusive teacher who breaks open every container that attempts to hold him in place. Jesus is calling us to die to self, but his idea of dying to self was not through inner renunciation, or guarding the purity of his being. It was through radically squandering everything he had and was. And St. Paul gets this holy squandering beautifully in today's letter to the Romans when he writes, Bless those who persecute you. Love and serve your enemies. To this day, in all world religions, this is the most radical message uttered. Bless those who persecute you. Love and serve your enemies. In fact, it's so foreign to hear this charge, we can't even make sense of it in our divisive world. As Cynthia Bourgeau writes in The Wisdom Jesus, John the Baptist's disciples were horrified of Jesus because he banqueted, drank, and danced. The Pharisees were horrified, too, because he healed on the Sabbath and kept company with women and disreputables, people known to be impure. Boundaries meant nothing to him. He walked right through them. What seemed disconcerting to nearly everybody was the messy, free-willing largeness of his spirit. Abundance and a generosity bordering on extravagant seemed to be the signature of both his teaching and his personal style. So we have to settle Jesus in this context with the same Jesus who said, do not store up treasures on earth. It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 
All of it will come to you in abundance, so long as you do not attempt to hoard or cling. It is a path Jesus walked to the very end. As I said before in our study of Mary Magdalene this past several months, Jesus parted ways with John the Baptist and his upbringing in the Essene community, a community of which a storing up to hold was their ascetic path. And, but Jesus goes the other way and pours his body out for the service of the world. So if Surrender is a letting go to let be. Then its opposite is hoarding, clinging to power, clinging to control, clinging to desired outcomes. It's micromanagement on steroids. Jesus tells us that surrender is the path to transformation, and hoarding is the path of illusion. If you want to save your life, you will lose it. And if you lose your life, you will save it. So this requires a lot of work. This requires a lot of work on our part to release from our minds the earthly world we are conditioned to think we inhabit. At best, the world most of us live in is the basic ground for either or dualisms to play themselves out. It's a world of sequential, linear time run by chaos, while the world Jesus is beckoning us into today is non-dual, a world that sees time in a spiral of synchronicity and interconnectedness and a space that sees St. Paul's call to love, not as a simple virtue or nicety, but as an energetic force that can actually change the world. It's a space that St. Paul's call to love reveals that it's not a simple virtue or nicety, but an energetic force that can actually change the world. And for those who think that we call virtues, what we call virtues are actually energies, sounds fluffy. There goes Father Ben talking about energy again. Let's talk for a moment about the negative energies swirling around us. We have to look no further at what unchecked, unaccountable, rampant narcissism has done to this country, the world, the planet. The me first mentality at the expense of everyone else is literally killing us with the energies of stress, disease, and fundamental dishonesty. And look what the energy of greed has corroded. It's corroded the actual earth. So just as these energies Paul lays out for us in our reading today can objective, objectively change the trajectory of our world, so too do their shadow energies lead us into the global decline of disorder, what physics calls entropy. And I think what Jesus is getting at in today's gospel is that the life we think we're saving and are hoarding is this life of entropy, this life of chaos. And that the life of entropy is ours to lose, to awaken into a life of evolved order and meaning. If we so choose. This is what Richard Rohr often refers to as order, disorder, reorder, or what I refer to as seeing Christianity as an open system, 
that can diffuse the negative virtues with the energies of the fruits of the Spirit. And what Jesus calls us into this morning. So if you're looking for hope, and I think we all are, we can move from disorder to reorder if we lose our life to save it. So as I see it right now, the roadmap looks a little bit like this. Just like Moses, we think we're not up for the task. But God says, I am with you. We're attempting this great feat right now with a conversation on race, knowing and sensing that God is with us in this crucial dialogue on human justice that we have no idea what, what, what will take us. And just like Paul, once we ingest the reality that God is with us in this endeavor called life, we can hold fast to what is good and love one another. And as he writes, contribute to the needs, the needs, contribute to the needs of the saints by living honestly, helping us overcome evil with good. And just like Jesus, we can surrender our most basic selves, our clinging, our hoarding selves, to live in the free kingdom of heaven. Or, as the eloquent prayer attributed to St. Francis that will be shortly sung by Sam, <clears throat> for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born into eternal life. From entropy, from chaos, to meaning. From disorder to reorder. The fruits of the Spirit can alter the world. We have real cleansing work to do with the removal of the toxins generated by fear, greed, scarcity, narcissism, Racism, violence, vengeance, shame, entitlement, indifference, group think, mass hysteria, addiction. All of these create serious toxicity, real pollution, which rains back down on our planet. The main work of this conscious circle of humanity that St. Paul and Jesus are urging us into today is to reduce this smog. And wh whenever and wherever possible, to rebalance it with, direct, with a direct infusion of those other elements in discussion this morning, namely love, joy, patience, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. Because what we need to realize is that these energies are the most powerful energetic nutrients in and for our world. And Jesus was on to this way before the self-help, new age, spa industry, industry distorted it for profit. So what if we learned to lose our lives to find them? What if we learned to deny the aspects of ourselves that the world says are the realist, looking out for number one at all costs and at the expense of everybody else? What if we learned to see with the eye of the heart and saw that through surrender we can die into new life? Because in the words of Jesus, 
What will it profit us if we gain the whole world but forfeit our life? We must learn to die before we die. Because what if divine things are human things? On the ground last week in North Carolina, we unearthed a decades-old labyrinth in a field. And while we spent several days pulling up the grass by hand and creating valleys between each stone in order to fill it with pebbles, there was a moment when things stopped spinning with all the daily tasks that we have to do. And for a second, I felt like I could feel the world breathing. This is the invitation Jesus gives us when we work together. What you lose, what you let go of, what you surrender, will be what finds you. And that's the precise moment at which reorder can begin. Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people, form six. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of, of the Church of God. For all who 
for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Peter, our bishop, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may find a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. On this day, we also pray for all our members at St. Gregory's, and especially for all those on our prayer list at St. Gregory's. We give thanks for the birthdays this week of Gianna Genovese, Ryan O'Geeblin, and Chad Apollinario. And today we give thanks for the wedding anniversary of Father Chuck and Barbara Wissing. Blessings to the Wissings. We pray for those in need, remembering especially Mia, Anne, Paula, Kimberly, and Angie. During this time of pandemic, we continue our prayers, Lord, for those who are affected by the virus, for those caring for those in need, for those developing researching vaccines and treatments for those who've been impacted economically by the pandemic, for schools and teachers, and staff and students. We pray for grace and healing. We lift up to you, our nation, Lord, during this time of conversation and reckoning about race. We pray for truth-telling and truth-listening as we remember and ask for healing for Jacob Blake. Help us, Lord. In the Anglican cycle of prayer today, we pray for our beloved companions in Bondo, Haiti, for Father Fenor and the community of Bon Samaritan Church and School. We pray for our friends and companions in the Diocese of Tuliara in Madagascar. We pray for Father Victor and Pastor Nlavi, for Bishop Todd and Patsy McGregor, and all our friends in the diocese. And I invite your additional prayers and thanksgivings at this time. We also remember today the life of Larry Paul as the flowers today are given in honor of his life by Isabel Paul. O oh Lord our God, hear the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen.
Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you. Peace, Ben. Peace, Anna. Peace, Ben. Peace, Anna. Peace to you all and welcome. We're so delighted you're joining us today for our online worship. Uh, bless you, and I know the Spirit of God is with us, connecting us uh, through time and space, and connecting all of us to God in a deep and life-giving way uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless you all. It's good to be with you worshiping today. Uh, a few things to highlight in our common life at St. Gregory's. One is that next week we begin a series of Zoom gatherings for members of the congregation as we continue our conversation about our capital campaign call to love and as we move into this phase of publicly encouraging all the members of the church to know about the campaign pray for the campaign and we pray support the campaign uh, so please note that those invitations will be coming uh, via email. They'll also be uh, recorded in our weekly digital uh, communication to the parish and other means as well. Uh, and I do invite your prayers uh, for the campaign as uh, that unfolds. Also, looking a little bit ahead, uh, not next weekend, but the following weekend, the week of Saturday the 12th and Sunday the 13th, is when we begin our fall programming ministry year. Uh, and we're kicking off our Sunday school this week with a joyful and I think celebratory drive through our parking lot on Saturday morning the 12th. And we'll be handing out uh, resource kits for children, youth, and families. It should be a lot of fun. I know many of us have participated in those kind of events to celebrate graduations and birthdays. So we thought we'd start the Sunday school year with that. So stay tuned, lots more uh, to come about that. That week also, starting on Sunday the 13th, uh, we begin not only our children's ministries for the fall, um, but we also kick off our adult formation classes. So Father Ben will be starting his wisdom school classes. I'll be leading my Rector's Bible study on Wednesdays. We'll be starting our adult confirmation class and formation on Sunday the 13th. So lots of material and opportunities for engagement and growing in faith and love uh, as we begin our ministry program year. Are we there yet when it comes to regathering for worship in person? Um, we're, of course, being guided, as I've been saying all along and as we've been uh, communicating to the parish, by some of the guidelines that the diocese has set forth for us. Um, we're particularly looking at the metrics of the infection rate being at 5% or less and a decline over two weeks of new cases. There's been a, a slight downward trend, and of course there's conversation about uh, Florida being in phase two, Palm Beach County being in phase two, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, but I know how eager everyone is, and I share that eagerness. I want you to know that. Um, so we'll be looking for ways to regather in person as the uh, health conditions warrant. Uh, we will probably be beginning with outdoor kinds of activities and limited small groups following good safety protocols. So I ask you to hang in there. God's grace is with us, the spirit is with us, and it will happen, and it'll be better than ever. Um, lastly, I just want to say just a word of thanks. I, I, I feel like I'm not saying this enough, so hear it, hear it loud and sincerely. I'm so grateful that our pledging members have been so faithful in maintaining their financial support for the mission of Jesus here at St. Gregory's, our mission of transforming hearts and community through Jesus' love. Uh, our service to those in need through our Meals with Meaning is dynamic and life-giving. We're always in need of volunteers. Contact us if you'd like to help with that. 
and uh, your financial support enables this mission to move forward. Uh, for those who are not pledging members, we invite you certainly to go to our website, make a pledge, download the St. Gregory's app, and share in our good work, which is the work of God in our community and in our world. Thank you. Birthday blessings and anniversary blessings. Uh, so let's virtually gather around the altar rail here, those of you who are celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week, and we'll offer this special and life-giving prayer. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, we give you thanks and praise for those times and moments in our lives where we are so mindful and so grateful for your abiding care. Bless these, your servants, celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Keep them rooted, grounded, growing, thriving in your life and love. And may God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this day, this year, and always. Amen. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Today's Eucharist is given in thanks to the glory of God for the life we share as a congregational family and in remembrance of the life of Larry Paul, husband of Isabel Paul, for whom the flowers are given to the glory of God and in memory of. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing 
always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask, through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them virtually. Take them into your hearts and souls by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. And feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation.
and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The wisdom of God, the love of God, and the grace of God strengthen you to be Christ's hands and heart in this world. And may the God of Moses, the God of Mary, the God and creator of us all, and Jesus, the redeemer of us all, and the spirit who energizes and renews us, the Holy Trinity, one God, bless, preserve, and keep you this day and forever. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia.
Good morning, St. Gregory's, and uh, what a joy to be worshiping again with you. Joy to have Father Ben back with us and uh, speaking so thoughtfully and eloquently about the gospel uh, and to enjoy once again uh, Sam singing and the glorious music uh, that's led by Tim. Um, so grateful for all of you and so grateful for the, oh, there's Father Ben in the distance photobombing us here. <laughs> so welcome back to Father Ben, uh, that masked priest. <laughs> and we're so, uh, we're so grateful for everyone. Love you all. Uh, hang in there. We're not there yet, but we will get there. And uh, in the meantime, uh, this is real and it's alive and it's life-giving. Uh, so I wish you a glorious week. I wish you an abundance of God's peace and may love and light and the energy that that releases in the world fill you and flow through you this week. Love you all. Bless you all. See you soon. Remember, we're online tomorrow, 9 a.m. I'll be leading morning prayer. Look forward to seeing some of you uh, on that, that time as well. God bless you all.